Chinese health authorities are still working to identify the virus behind a pneumonia outbreak in the central city of Wuhan. I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. We will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States. Breaking news tonight, the coronavirus forcing millions more Americans into virtual lockdown. Over 75 million people in New York, California, Illinois and Connecticut ordered to stay at home. This um, period that we're in right now, we're still a little premature to predict the recovery and, and what the plans will be to get back to the business of hosting these meetings. No one could have ever predicted that a trillion dollar industry could be brought to a screeching halt from a virus. But the novel coronavirus was about to prove just how destructive it could be to an industry as resilient as live business meetings, events, and travel. Organizations like Meeting Professionals International MPI, were determined to reunite the industry in person, but that they accomplished that goal. I was probably became acutely aware of the threat of COVID in early March. I was in New York City, was there to go and attend the Big East basketball tournament. And actually the first afternoon of the tournament, the morning session began and I went out with some friends to have lunch because we planned to attend the second session. And we're watching the game and halftime came and the teams never came back out. And then we heard the news that the Big East Conference had decided to cancel their basketball tournament. The night before the ACC had canceled, the Big Ten had canceled. Uh, we thought the fact that they had started, um, they would still continue. Uh, and it all started to really come home. Um, so did I think WC in June at that point was threatened? Not yet. It wasn't probably till later March, um, and even into early um, April that we began to think around, we need to look for alternatives for our June conference. So some of those initial conversations with our hotel, um, Gaylord Texan, you know, was a little bit of a cat and mouse just because neither of us really knew what this would look like. Could we just push it one month? Uh, we knew we couldn't cancel. We always told them we weren't going to cancel. We didn't know if we could push it two months or if we had to push it further down. And meanwhile, uh, what I found out later after some, some good um, you know, conversations on the sly with, with my partners is you know, they had already cut a lot of their sales team. So they were handling multiple, multiple issues with a skeletal staff. And I remember my uh, counterpart at the hotel saying something like they were handling 200 requests for change um, or postponements or cancellations in one week at the same time of ours. And, and ours is, we want to think it's an important event, but it's not the biggest event they do. And we won't come back year after year. So there's much bigger pieces of business for this ho the hotel that, um, that needs some TLC. And we were just waiting in line to kind of get it addressed. So it felt like they were hedging at first, but I know now, and I knew after I learned is that it was just a matter of of kind of bandwidth and the complexity of a huge hotel. You know, usually in the live event world, you have an A plan and a B plan. What, what I learned, and I think the team learned, is we needed A, B, C, D, E, and F uh, through this planning process. There was no end to what the variables or impacts could be. So we, as we looked at June, it was important for us to have a live event. MPIs remained bold in that from the very beginning. And our strategy was to always push it back until the point in the year that we knew we could have it live. We did not want to go digital. We didn't want to just do a hybrid. We wanted it to be both fully live and fully live digital. So to me, what really set the final decision in place was when IMAX America canceled. And we knew from Ray and Karina how severe the impact was going to be on our industry. And at that point, it became very serious about how far back we could push WEC and still try to get it in the year 2020. So the first thing I, I had to really do when it came to the in-person experience was figure out whether or not I was comfortable doing this. Um, and so that was something that, you know, I had some 
tough conversations with myself about where we were, um, what the current conditions were. I needed to convince myself first. And, and I had to do that from an ethical perspective too, because if I wasn't comfortable or I was just telling myself that I was going to have to do it because I was MPI, then that, that wouldn't be ethical for me because I would be then telling other people to come on site and join me. And so that was really my first kind of decision was, is this something that not only am I comfortable with, but do I actually feel like we can accomplish and design and execute on a safe experience? Only then could I step forward and say that I supported the organization in making the decision and that that it was it was it was good it was okay for me to say come join me at, at WEC and ultimately I did make that decision I did feel comfortable I did feel like our team was executing on an incredibly safe experience that I could stand behind although MPI successfully rescheduled WEC for November many questions lingered was this the right decision how would they ensure the safety of attendees was it too premature to host an in person event of this size already partnering with in-house physicians to have a clinic on site. So how is it that we can further that, uh, uh, that partnership with in-house physicians to do daily temperature check? We also asked the attendees to complete the what we call the automated daily COVID health screening, answering just some simple questions um, each morning to ensure that we were mitigating the risk of somebody potentially putting other attendees at risk during the event. Obviously, the CDC uh, put out their um, guidelines for, for gatherings at events uh, and had a checklist that helped us out as well uh, that we definitely used in case anyone asked us a question. That was our guiding principle as, as, as we went forward. Working with the Gaylord Texan, we were talking to them on a weekly basis along with the, with the city of Grapevine about what was happening in their areas. And then of course, partnering with the Gaylord, what are you doing? How is it that we can, we can uh, uh, help our attendees feel safe from a lodging standpoint, from a meeting space standpoint? You know, how often are you cleaning? Not only the meeting space, but the rooms. How often are you, uh, you know, wiping down escalator handrails and, and those kinds of things. So the ball just kind of started rolling. I mean, it's, it's extremely important to have the chief of police, to have the fire chief, you know, to have representatives of the medical community and such engaged with you so as though you're getting advice from what their perspective is about what you're doing. All the resources exist in every destination to be able to stage meeting. You have to be prepared financially, the costs and such will be greater. But what I will tell you, your vendors in the industry will work with you because they too need the reboot. They were doing health checks, uh, they were doing health surveys every day, they were banding people in, they were trying to create their own bubble as best as they could without on-site testing. The only thing that would have made it better would have been on-site testing. It's not required by the CDC, nowhere is it in the policies, nor is it necessary. But they did a really good job in, in that component, step one. Step two, they made sure everybody was following protocol as far as wearing their mask, keeping their distance. I thought what MPI did with food and beverage was amazing. And, and I mean that because to take a large group and have to feed them, you know, to look at how they spread out the stations. And again, that was in partnership with their hotel partners, but it was really well done. I was actually very, very pleased with the entire experience. Um, the amount of protocol around cleaning, uh, and thought process and more importantly communication I, I thought was key. I would say that the communication before the conference was uh, fantastic working um, with the staff and keeping me informed. I would say the hotel did a great job as well. I believe that the daily check-in for your temperature was encouraging um, when I when I actually registered. Uh, having uh, the registration in a box where it's kind of no contact was 
was good as well. And I think people overwhelmingly respected people's spaces. They've been really great with their signage. They had stickers out on the table today in the general session. And if you were a certain color sticker, they asked you to leave through the back of the room and that anybody else with the other color sticker to hold out just a little bit and then take their time and exit from the side doors. And then I think what was really impactful was they allowed enough time for lunch. So there's not the mad rush of, oh, I only have 45 minutes to get to lunch and eat and go to the next session. The timing worked really well. What, one thing that just was really kind of brought a lot of joy to me was at the nighttime events, which you think that's where people would get a little more complacent. It's dark, there's drinking and eating, there's dancing. I mean, you just saw a dance floor full of people dancing, joy in their faces, and they are masked up. Because I think what people realized is, hey, we want some of this to come back. The, the joy we feel of being together again, of learning together again, of this collaboration, it can only work during this pandemic if we follow these rules. I was part of the host committee and uh, obviously uh, our city was the designated city to host the final night reception. So hosted by our program, had some involvement with that and then of course uh, mainly coordinating and uh, orchestrating that final night reception to wrap up WEC and in Arlington at uh, turns out to be Texas Live. But originally the final night reception was slated to be hosted at uh, our new baseball stadium, Globe Life Field. And uh, we had drawn up plans to uh, basically drive the buses uh, onto the field and, and drop people off and have a, a grandiose event. And then COVID hit and uh, of course uh, that changed things and the WEC dates as we all know delayed and got changed. Obviously anytime you have an event off-site, you know, what is that uh, one of the concerns we had was what does that commute time include and is it, is it lengthy? Can we entertain or create some activation during that, that uh, transportation? The, the motor coaches obviously were not full. They, they distanced those so that uh, you know, a normal 50 passenger bus would have probably 15 or 20 folks on it depending on the, the particular bus and making sure they're spaced and distanced. Uh, staggered arrivals so that the group didn't all arrive at once and uh, we had a welcoming team there that uh, would walk folks in but uh, and then of course in the venue uh, Arlington Backyard which is sort of an indoor outdoor venue which actually helped us that night and weather was perfect knock on wood but uh, we were able to have an open air environment and had plenty of space to distance folks and uh, have spacing as it relates to tables we did have a big open space for folks if they wanted to enjoy the music which they did but uh, still properly distanced and as uh, was mentioned earlier sanitation stations and then careful consideration for how food was presented so that there was not a lot of, you know, hand contact in terms of food service. When March 14th hit, there were obviously, there were points leading up to that. So my team was already starting to work. The entire MPI team was starting to work, starting to come together and think about, okay, is this going to be a reality that we need to deal with? When the pandemic was declared, we were already working towards our contingency solutions uh, for marketing and, and our, our plans to get prepped um, to get the message out on how we're going to handle it. So we had started developing out a number of different resources still being used heavily today that were all accessible on the website. Uh, we actually developed an entire campaign called Trusted Resources. And if you go to the website now, mpi.org slash trusted resources, it's still there. And we were creating all of these resources that were international in scope, but primarily focused on the meeting and event professional. So we had everything from guidelines that were being released to the CDC, to guidelines that were being released by a, an organization in the UK. Uh, we had employment resources because we saw that this could, this could have an impact, especially on our groups. If we're not able to meet, that means jobs are gonna be a problem. So we immediately rallied together and, and it was cross-departmental. The original theme around WEC was create authentic experiences. Once a pandemic was declared, we immediately took a step back and said, all right, there's a bigger opportunity here, right? And this was still considering the June event. So we completely rebranded for the third time, mind you, completely rebranded around Reunite for Recovery. Because our thought was that we are still gonna be able to come together in June and it's gonna be the first time that this community can get together. So when then it was postponed, our first action was to assess and think about Reunite for Recovery and what that means. If anything, Reunite for Recovery took a much bigger stance and a bigger meaning for WEC. And then from a communications perspective, we were constantly working to get the message out there about this is what we are going to do at WEC. Here are the guidelines we are following. Here are the check boxes that we are going through. 
here are all of the regulations that we are going to adhere to to make sure that your safety is first and top priority. And in the midst of COVID-19, I was really put at ease with the communication that was provided by um, the MPI team and also the level of excellence from the Gaylord team. So that those combined when I know those two, you know, parties were working together so intently to make sure they communicated safety and that there was all kinds of processes and procedures in place combined when I know those two, you know, parties were working together so and saw everything in place and especially when I arrived to the hotel. But not all members share the sentiment. Some thought it was irresponsible for MPI to proceed with an in-person event and shared their thoughts on social media and beyond. I definitely appreciated all the precautions they were taking, but for me, from a personal perspective, I knew that I was not comfortable attending. I was actually asked to speak on a panel as well, and when I voiced my hesitation in attending and asked could I, be, could I participate virtually in the panel and kind of going along with the idea of hybrid, I was told no, unfortunately I would need to be in person. An increase in communication proved to be important, even for longtime WCMC, Dina Blizzard, who had her own hesitations. In terms of on stage, um, you know, from the beginning, I had said to them, how does this look um, if, from my point of view? And we had agreed that I would not be wearing a mask while hosting and uh, that everybody in the room would continue wearing a mask. And so I thought, okay, you know, I haven't been anywhere without a mask, but if we are all going to come to this place where, you know, you'll be masked so that I can look normal, right, to the people in the room and the people at home. Um, and that was our plan. At one point, it was brought up that there were going to be singers during the show, and that was difficult for me. I spent a lot of time just staying away from people, pulling my kids out of activities, um, and so that was uncomfortable. But I took that to the team at MPI, and, and we were able to talk through it and uh, make it so that there were times where I did wear a mask, where I didn't feel comfortable. Um, and there were times that we just kind of uh, changed staging of things so that um, not only myself, but even the guests that came up on stage. I mean, I at times didn't have a mask on and it really was how far away do they need to be for them to feel comfortable, for me to feel comfortable. And so, you know, whether it was MPI or it was any of the guests that we had on the show, I, I think that that was a really important part of it was just honoring how everybody individually felt and doing our best to, to make that happen. Yeah, the 14 days after WC were pins and needles, man. Pins and needles, because I mean, legitimately, every single day we are talking internally. Okay, has, have we heard anything? Has anybody contacted us? And every single day we're getting requests from media. You know, what's the results? What's the results? How many cases? How many cases? And so then when, you know, we did finally get somebody that said they, they you know, they, they tested positive, it's just like, okay, all right. So we immediately went into action, did contact tracing, nothing. And then another one came up and like came up within a day or something like that. And we're like, oh no, here it comes. Here comes the, the dam is breaking. I did contact tracing and nothing. And then that was it. And so it was just, it was, again, that 14 day window hit and it was like another set of elation. Just, we did it. MPI felt the pressure of creating a compelling digital experience, also being the first hybrid event in a year where the industry was growing weary of digital conferences. What did MPI learn? How do they want this example to encourage others in our industry? It was a different experience uh, designing the digital version of the event and that started with a really focusing on the design of what we wanted it to look like. So we couldn't choose a partner, we couldn't choose a platform, we couldn't choose the education that was going to happen as part of the digital experience until we had set goals and objectives around that and designed an experience because we didn't know what elements of a platform we might need. We didn't know what types of speakers we want, might want to bring on or what other technological elements we might need until we had actually designed what the experience looked like. So that was really our first step was to step back and take a look at what we wanted to accomplish digitally. 
We did an RFP out to about 50 different technological uh, technology companies uh, and different platforms. And we asked them, here's a look at what we're trying to create. Uh, here's a look at who our attendees are going to be. Uh, are you interested in partnering us? Do you have the right uh, specifications that we're looking for? And can we work together to create a digital experience for our audience? And that was really the start of the, the digital design. Well, in addition to your typical meeting objectives related to attendance, uh, KPI performance, uh, finances, things like that, we also wanted to build a community. We wanted people to feel like they were part of the experience and knowing that they were going to have a different event, they were attending a different event, but it was in parallel to the in-person experience. We wanted them to feel like they were part of that experience. And so that really played into the design of what we did for the digital attendees. Ultimately, when you're looking at a hybrid event, you are planning two meetings. You're planning a live component and a virtual component. And there's times where content overlaps and speaks to both audiences. There's times where you want to target them differently. Some other things to look at is how you break down the barriers between the live audience and the virtual audience. Ensuring that they all are experiencing a same level of event experience. There's a sense of interaction. Everybody has a voice, a sense of community and networking. The schedules vary and you need to be strategic and how you're approaching and planning the content um, and activities. You look at television and how successful uh, that is. And really that, you know, from a uh, talk show perspective, the live audience is a VIP experience. And the content is presented through the lens of the camera to the home audience. And you really have to take that approach um, and concept and, and really apply that to all your keynote presenters. They've got to connect with that virtual audience. And the only way to do that is through the camera. Um, you can't just speak to a room and you're playing a camera in there and, and stream that to a virtual audience and, and call it done. That's not going to be successful. One of the really important parts going into this hybrid experience was how do you engage with the people in the room but also reach out to the people at home and not just in a way that they feel like they're watching you interact with the people in the room, but they actually felt like they were being talked to. And so uh, it was the first time for all of us and there is a tremendous amount of technology out there. The question was how best <laughs> to use that technology and it was a first for all of us. And so, um, you know, so many times we said, okay, let's really just talk to the virtual audience. So if you looked at different at different parts of those shows, there were some shows that we made the decision, this will be directed to the audience in the room and we'll at some points talk to the virtual audience. There were a few shows where it was directly to the virtual audience and at other times we would talk to the people in the room. And and that was a conscious decision. And I think it's um, I think it's it was a great one. I feel very comfortable in that space. I think that if you are going to be hosting conferences, it's really important to make sure you find a host that's comfortable doing both. Sometimes we did it well, sometimes it didn't go well, but I think that the audience was very gracious on on both sides in the room and virtually. And uh, and I think, you know, hopefully people learned a lot from it. Uh, I know I did as as a performer and as a talent and the host. So um, so I think it was great. I would just encourage any organization that relies on face to face business events to be bold. This can be done. You can do it safely. Uh, it takes a lot of extra care, it takes a lot of extra time to do it, but um, it's possible. And I think we've got to show our industry has got to get back to work. We just have our supply chain as an industry overall is too big to not be successful and it's too big to um, not begin to get the cash register going. And uh, you can't do that fully on hybrid and digital, it's just impossible. The scale is just not there and the experience is not there. And so again, when we look around who our partners who have supported MPI in our industry for 50 years, we've got to get heads and beds. We've got to get people back on airplanes. We've got to get people up on stage presenting again and telling a story. We've got to get our meeting planners planning live events again. And while you can do that and augment that through a digital environment, it's just not the same. And so I would encourage uh, organizations that are considering it once they've made a decision that it's right to do live, to stay committed, learn, educate, reach out, reach out to companies like MPI to get uh, lessons learned from us. The duty of care is probably the most critical piece. You have to really be 
uh, thoughtful about and execute on if you do it. It's the handbook, it's their journey, it's the learner journey that's going to take place and it's really what is going to make your attendees feel comfortable with showing up live again, that they're going to be protected and they're going to be safe. Well, certainly from a health consideration standpoint, we have to think very carefully about what we're doing, not only for myself, but our entire team. It's a whole new set of rules as those of us in the travel and tourism industry begin to manage this intersection between travel and public health. But we also know that meetings are important to create millions of jobs and they help to sustain progress throughout our world. So it's incredibly important that we reinvest and recharge the economy by getting meetings moving again. And that's one of the reasons why we're here at WEC with MPI. You got to know who it is that you're planning for. And that really helps you guide how how accessible are they going to be to rules and regulations, right? You, you obviously have to have a minimum of wherever it is that you're holding that you're holding a meeting. But would your are, are your attendees going to be okay with temperature checks or would they prefer to have COVID testing on site? Uh, so so you know you got to figure out who your audience is, what's going to make them feel safe to come to your meeting, especially if it's not a mandatory meeting or those kinds of things. And even if it is a mandatory meeting, you have to be the person that can sell your attendees, that can sell your partners, that can you know, make sure that you are paving the path. You're the first one in line. You're paving the path and paving the way to put on meetings successfully. Because we really wanted to use this as a case study to demonstrate how to safely execute and host a meeting with duty of care and wellness at the forefront. It was critical that it wasn't just about our staff. It wasn't just about our partners. Every person who made the choice to show up in person had an obligation to ensure that we were conducting this event in a safe way. And it was amazing to see everyone step up to that. So we all, we all got distracted at certain points and, and pulled our masks down. We all got too close at certain points but we kindly reminded each other and there was no offense taken. And what was so incredible after those four days together is when you look back on it, how everyone took that obligation so seriously because they realized they were there for a bigger purpose. They were there for their normal experience of networking, their normal experience of professional growth, their normal experience of, of seeing each other and learning. But more importantly, they were there to demonstrate to the world that you can safely host a meeting with the proper communication, the proper protocols, and the proper focus on those, those processes that you put into place. And, and that was what was phenomenal. In a time where uncertainty surrounds us, MPI took a risk that proved to be successful. But will this experience serve as a blueprint for safely gathering as the industry forges ahead with recovery? With the increase in vaccinations and countries slowly reopening, MPI is determined to execute another in-person World Education Congress in Las Vegas this summer, where they'll have another opportunity to demonstrate the lessons they learned from Grapevine. Can they pull it off again? Only time will tell, and we will be there to tell that story.